Okay, welcome everyone to the X Umbers podcast, uh, Scholar McClarney, and with me is none other than Schoolman Fawcett, uh, and we are teachers at the uh, Trestrian Academy of St. Isidore Learning Center, the world's only online Trestrian Academy. These podcasts are a sample of what a uh, class with us might be like, what a lesson or a lecture or a conversation, a dialogue ultimately, in a Trestrian Academy might be like. Uh, so we're classical Catholic education and podcast form, and uh, part of what it means to be classical is uh, well, there's like two layers to this, I guess. Sure. One is that we're talking about the classics of literature and philosophy and history, yep. and there's also that we're rooted in this classical worldview that ultimately comes to, from the history of the church. And the, the topic that you've proposed for today, Dr. McClarney, connects both of these. What are we talking about yeah, today? Well, we want to talk about otherness and the other, and how this connects to our life, our fulfillment, specifically how this is looked at from the framework of a philosopher we've mentioned before in passing, Hegel. In contrast to St. Irenaeus. Ah, right. Now, uh, so it's an interesting kind of uh, lineup, I suppose, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, now, Hegel, just for context, we, we mentioned him a little bit yeah. in passing. Uh, as, we, as we go, he, he dies in uh, 1831. So some people might think he's a classical thinker already, but he's mm-hmm. certainly, well, I guess it's 200 years uh, about. At this uh, point, I think he'd be considered like a the phenomenology of spirit and all that would be considered classics, I suppose, right? Uh, right. You can't understand uh, Heidegger or uh, Gadamer or uh, Karl Rahner in the Catholic theological tradition. You can't understand any of these guys or, or people reacting against them, like Kierkegaard, right? Who we all consider, you know, they're all considered classic thinkers, I guess, in philosophy at this point. So, yeah, I think Hegel, for better or for worse, has a pretty integral place in that edifice, uh, you know, as a, a classical thought, you know. Sure, and, and sometimes, uh, it, it, we'll, we'll get to Irenaeus too, at, I think, at the end, uh, as we go now, I think how he offers a broader view of, of the other than what we see in Hegel, but... And if you've never heard of Gadamer or, or Heidegger or, or Karl Rahner, uh, surely you've heard of Karl Marx and uh, probably heard of Nietzsche as well. Yes. Uh, and so they also are influenced by um, Hegel and, and, and they take different aspects or different facets of his thought mm-hmm. and, run, and run with it. So, we, yeah, I mean, if you're in, into history and you know mm-hmm. about uh, communist revolutions or fascism, both of those are interconnected. In, in different ways, and also we see um, th- these emanating as well from Hegelian thought. So, yeah, though the, the, certainly uh, the a- applicability of understanding a little bit of Hegel goes a long way. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, okay, maybe you're not into history, though. Uh, I mean, who likes history classes anyhow? I, I don't know. Do, sure. you know. do you know anyone? Oh, possibly I have somebody <laughs> who did a degree in it, okay. you know, right. of, of sorts, one yeah, could yeah, say, yeah. right? But So, so uh, also, though, if we ever hear someone speaking about uh, being on the right side of history yes. or the arc of the, the moral arc of the universe or something like this. Or we, using language like history will judge this thing. Or judge yeah. me rightly, or judge you poorly, right? Right. That language is all Hegelian and its backdrop. Yeah. yeah. Or even as simple as saying, in this um, new era, all right, this is now what's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're now standing at the um, penultimate stage before the final era will be ushered in, or something like mm-hmm. this. This is also a type of. Um, well, I mean, this is by way of Marx, but when you hear people talk about being in late capitalism. Right, there's something Hegelian there. This idea that history is coming in these stages. I'm sure we'll get into this in a second, but right, yeah. that we're coming to the end of one of these stages of history. That's yeah. it, you know, sort of inevitable. So we can know we're in late capitalism because yeah. we know the trajectory of history. So, or that we live in different contradictions. You'll hear people talking about this way. Oh yeah, people live that's in a great. The contradictions of history, right? Yeah. Like women are. Uh, uh, you know, politically liberated but culturally oppressed, so they're in this contradiction. Like, when you hear language like this, that's also straight out of Hegel. Yes. Um, yeah. Other others as well that will probably occur to us as we talk. But this is that's another thing that's important is that whether you're interested in philosophy or history or not, <laughs> um, it, there's a sense it's like we're all Keynesians now, like we're all you know, <laughs> we're all Hegelians now in some way, and it's worth being aware of. Oh, the zeitgeist. That's another one. Just oh, that yes. phrase, the zeitgeist, yeah. that people use very casually, but that's directly from Hegel, right? That's right. His concept. So it's worth knowing about what what he's about, uh, so that we can understand the world we're in and understand. Uh, if, whether this aligns with what Christ is calling us to, because if we want to follow Christ, we need to sort of see, well, if, if we're Hegelians, does this line up with 
the Christian vision or not. Yeah. Which as we'll discuss, I'm sure, is where well, Irenaeus is very yeah, helpful. Yeah, I mean, that might be a, an interesting place just to come in uh, on, on that point is uh, how does this line up with, with a Christian vision or not? But I guess what we've just done in these opening dialogue is just to establish that Hegel's shadow. We don't hear about him that often. He's not as a famous philosopher as some of the other big names, but his influence is one that we're still dealing with. We're in his wake, essentially. Now, uh, is, so in terms of Christianity, though, that, that's an interesting point. How does, how does he differ with with this age, this dawn, this era? Because we do see uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophetic tradition, as well as in the New Testament prophetic tradition, this anticipation of a new era, which will mm-hmm. be ushered in. Uh, and this is a uh, profound uh, uh, core, a tenet of of what we believe as as mm-hmm. as, as Christians. Uh, and so it's good to know how this gets re... Uh, I'm actually going to use the word uh, secularized. Uh, okay. It becomes yeah. secularized yeah. by... by um, Hegel. Uh, it, it means not just him, but him. It is certainly giving us this framework. So if you want to think of it this way, um, the Middle Ages, who's, who's I'm, I don't know, I'll ask Mr. Fawcett here, uh, who's the greatest theologian, would you say, of the Middle Ages? Of the Middle Ages? I'll, I'll, I'll be, I guess, non-controversial here. I'll, I'll say it's Thomas Aquinas. Okay, sure. And I know you also teach literature uh, and your course goes through medieval literature and so who would you say what's one of the biggest books that you cover in your class in literature well for I mean for influence and scope I, I mean it's got to be Dante right there, there you go Dante, yeah. so, so many would say the Middle Ages is the pinnacle of theology mm-hmm. uh, Aquinas uh, giving us the understanding of God and, and through theology and then I guess through literature Dante also very giving us this full expression of uh, what it means to be in union with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so what's the next era after this would be the Renaissance, mm-hmm. right? This the type of new birth or rebirth where now the focus is no, it's not so much theocentric as anthropocentric. Mm-hmm. And by that we simply mean is now the focus becomes on the human being, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and, and what we can do, this uh, rediscovery of... Um, Art and so on. That's very really much focused on the human body, uh, mm-hmm. and, and so yeah, this is um, the direction. Now, following that, after the Renaissance, what, what's kind of the dominant modus operandi or the dominant way people kind of look and discuss? What are they discussing mostly? At well, point? yeah, I mean, fleshing out from that. I mean, this is these are always reductionistic, right? You know, the sure. Middle yeah. Ages followed it's, by the Renaissance, yeah. but then we'll talk about yeah. the, the Enlightenment. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, what, what would be a f- what's one thing that's really been focused on there would be well, like science, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and what science analyzing? What's it looking at? So it's we've moved away from focusing on God or even the human. Now we're really focusing on well, nature, right? The, yeah. the order, yeah. the natural order, and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. You can see deism uh, takes root as well, which is going to mm-hmm. make nature all the more uh, important to understand because that's all we're really working with uh, uh, right so but once uh, we have you know these great minds who've devoted their careers and several generations towards nature well we need something more right and this is where Hegel comes in so it's no longer uh, a god or man or nature the next big thing we need to focus on is history uh, right, and so this is where we get the march of reason uh, and this this uh-huh. culmination of history. And so this is these parameters when we talk about being judged by history, our uh, progress, yeah. and so on. We're moving towards. So Hegel is going to uh, throw this uh, uh, the ball of history back into the court, if you want to think of it that way, of human thought. And we're still kind of dealing with the volleying back uh, these um, uh-huh. uh, these issues in terms of this framework of looking at reality so we're not really looking at reality in terms of you know if as if god existed right or if god is the pinnacle of all of our lives or it's not so much focused on the human or, or nature but now it's it's history so that's one way of thinking of hegel's mm-hmm. significance in in framing our discussions mm-hmm. along those lines yes well yeah i mean there's a, a, it's an interesting way of laying it up for sure lots of ways to think about that um i mean i guess another way into that is to say you know, the, the Renaissance, there's a focus, I mean, this is when we have humanism, right? The yeah. Middle Ages are characterized by scholasticism. Uh, the Middle Age, the Renaissance is kind of characterized by humanism, which doesn't mean it's necessarily secular humanist. I mean, like Thomas More and uh, Erasmus, right? Cervantes. Or, yeah. Sure, exactly. Right? These are all like um, 
but they're, they're humanistic in the sense of this hum, the human being, and this is often is through the lens of the fact that we're in the image of God and we have dignity. Yeah. Uh, but now that's the kind of you know, the focus now. What a, what a piece of work is a man, you yes. know, and this sort of yeah. thing. Uh, but as that happens, there's there's a bit of an eclipse of God in the process, uh, just by virtue of how much we're looking at right. uh, the human and yes. how great our minds are. And then yeah. that leads into enlightenment. And of course, to me, the ultimate enlightenment thinker is Immanuel Kant, right? Oh, good old Kant. Who yes. writes because he writes the essay on it. What is enlightenment? And he talks about it's the power of the human mind, right? Yeah. We're entering the age of enlightenment, and it's an ongoing process. So if humans are great, that means we can use our reason uh, to to discover the truth ourselves. Part of the Renaissance is also and this is this is important because it starts to move things towards Hegel a little bit. Uh, is the Renaissance there's a bit of a discovery or a rediscovery you could say of the idea of historical distance. I don't know what do we mean oh, by that, right? right? Yeah. Uh, if you look at a lot of medieval art, yeah. it depicts biblical scenes, right? Yeah. You, uh, and, and they're dressed like they're in the Middle Ages. Right. There's woodcuts yes. or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, and. Some would say that's because there wasn't a strong sense of historical distance, of how much things have changed in 1,500 years or more, right, right. since the scripture. Yeah. There, there's a, a sense that things are static. Now, some people might say, no, that's not what it's about. It, it's a theological statement that it's, it's situating ourselves within the biblical story and making it relevant to us or whatever. But, oh, yeah, but so it's us, us entering into the life uh, of an objective I, I want, text I wonder as, if as opposed to the subjective yes. imposition on the text. Right, it'd be like if someone watched yeah. a, one of these adaptations of Shakespeare where they're wearing modern clothing and say, oh, these 20th century people had yeah. no understanding of historical distance. Yeah. No, maybe that's the opposite. But, but right. regardless okay. of that, sure. there's this perception that in the Middle Ages people sort of thought, and there's fairness, in fairness, right, this does come from ancient Greece where the idea is that change is bad yeah. and whatever is unchanging is necessarily better or it's eternal, right? Uh, in the Renaissance you begin to have this, because it's a, a rediscovery of, it's a rebirth of pagan learning. People are revisiting these ancient texts for various historical reasons. Uh, the Crusades, right? The Constantinople Falls and a bunch of scholars fle flee to the West and bring the resources with them so we can read these things in the original Greek again. But it's return to the sources, ad fontes. And as people kind of read about the past more and study the past more, they start using more of a critical eye towards it and yeah. realizing that things have changed or yeah. some of our perceptions about the past are... I mean, some of Aristotle's science is bad. Yep. Maybe the donation of Constantine is actually a forgery. Right, right. right. Like, so there's a yeah. beginning of so there's a beginning of the sense that history is a real thing that's happened, um, and and it actually does put a distance between us and people in the past, and maybe it's still ongoing. Uh, now, yeah. this is a separate topic, but you could argue that Augustine already knew this. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, that early Christian theology sort of understood this. We'll get to that when we get to Irenaeus, I'm sure. Um, but now there is this sense of well, there's history that's actually going on. And maybe history has some role in what it means to be a human being. And this kind of leads us into Hegel, right? Where now he's the first modern philosopher, let's say, to really look at that head on and say, okay, if humans are historical beings and history means there's real change, right? Someone now is different than someone in the Renaissance. Someone in the Renaissance is differently right. situated because of historical forces and context and where they live and when they live than yeah. someone in the ancient Near East. Well, what does that mean, all right? And that's where his philosophy enters into it, is to say, like, okay, what, what has history done to us? Right? Which is taking what the Bible does and the Christian story does, which is to say that God has a plan. There's a beginning, middle, and end to history. And right, uh, it's, it, God's way of dealing with us changed between Adam and Moses and between Moses and Christ and between Christ's first coming and the second coming. He's saying that like, there's a story there. There's Absolutely. a linear thing where things yeah. change and develop. And I think you're absolutely right. And it's secularizing it. Uh, so maybe this is a point to talk about what he actually does, you know? Well, yeah, and, well, I can't resist, though, just elaborate on one point there, but mm -hmm. secularizing history. So, like, if, um, speak of Augustine and the ages that he's looking at, right, from, from Adam to Moses and so on, or Noah, rather. Uh, no, I don't, there, uh, Augustine's going to um, retain a certain... Um, well, there's a priority of God uh, mm -hmm. to be the actor, uh, to be the one who, uh, the revelator uh, in this sure. final age yeah, that yeah, we're in, sure. uh, as opposed to um, if you take God out of the picture, mm -hmm. right, and you have these ages, well, we're in this, this current age that we're in, right, uh, well, um, who's the actor, right? Who's the revelator? Uh, mm -hmm. Who unfurls what, what, is, what is to come? And so this is kind of, I guess, you might say, um, that, that accentuates, I suppose, a, yeah, a secular yeah. 
uh, historicism uh, or frame of looking at reality uh, from the Christian one, where, mm-hmm. yes, we do have these covenants that, yeah, that yeah. mark, uh, delineate God's revelation in time and God's action. But this is, well, that precisely that, God's action. It's God's initiative. Uh, and so we are co-participants uh, in this um, drama uh, but mm-hmm. it's it's not. It, but there's a primary actor. Well, let, well, let's right. note that the, the almost uh, the almost the redundancy of saying to his uh, what you call secularized history, because right. the secular means age, right? That's the, the yeah, whole idea right. of the secular is that yeah. there's the sacred, yeah. and then there is which is you know has to do with the eternal, and then out of the concept of the sacred comes the idea of the secular. This is a whole historical thing. Right, right. You know, right. now we're all secular and we don't believe in the sacred, but actually the whole idea. of Secular doesn't make sense without the sacred, right? So um, we're in the, uh, that's even, even our prayer, right? Uh, now, glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. I mean, in Latin, that's secular secularum, right? That's eight, which is from the Greek, right? The age yeah. of ages, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. So we're, we're heading towards the age of ages, the secular secularum, uh, but now we're currently in this age, the secular, and that's what it means to talk about secular clergy or whatever. It's like, that, you know, they're working in this world, but it's an age. It's a historical era that's building up to the culmination of the ages of ages. So second one, the secularization of history, it's kind of saying, well, it's the age that we're in that's distinguished from the transcendent. And then you just pull the transcendent out, right? Yes. <laughs> you pull the sacred yeah. out of the secular, right? Or merge them. Or you merge them, yeah, which is, um, which is a move that Hegel's going to do. Uh, I mean, he's a... Um, Part of, part of the, we mentioned Kant earlier, he's going to be the poster child of enlightenment where everything becomes rational, including, let's say, like the goal of Christianity, for mm-hmm. example. He's going to give a rational basis for it, which he's anxious to do as a pious Lutheran. Um, however, uh, the, the, this rationalization um, mm-hmm. is one that, well, it can become that, uh, r- rationalistic. And, and re- so it's, it's the opposite of uh, fideism, right, where everything is based on faith and reason is um, to the detriment of reason. Mm-hmm. Now everything is based on reason to the detriment of faith. So Hegel is going to have this mysticism about his writings, uh, which is going to kind of retry to invigorate metaphysics and, and mm-hmm. bring almost a, um, uh, well, you might, Hegel might see it as like a primitive Greek uh, kind of spirit, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like Nietzsche uh, in some ways of, of, of revitalizing the West. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, um, the question then becomes, well, if, if, if you're going to merge this, uh, who's now your prophet, right? Mm-hmm. So who's now your, well, your re- revelator, right? Yeah, who's, yeah. who's now the one? And Okay, so uh, today you might have, we might have uh, many people, prophets, uh, who are... Uh, advocating this is where history should be going. Or would, uh-huh. you, and whenever, the, you know, I always encourage my students, whenever someone's speaking along those lines, just say, on, on, okay, how do they know that, right? Uh-huh. Uh, what, what reasons are they giving you for the information which they have? Uh-huh. Uh, how do they know this is where we should be progressing, uh-huh. uh, right? So, uh, okay. Oh, and which, there's another example. When people will talk about um, this politician introduces a, you yes. know, a policy, uh, you know, some policy that's seen as, Regressive rather than progressive. Uh, yes, and they say he's, he's, they're turning back the clock. Right. right? We, yes. Well, that there's an assumption there that like history has to progress in a certain direction, and, like and, and not just not just descriptively but normatively. Right. Like history yes. is going this way, therefore we ought to be going this way too. Uh, oh, uh, absolutely. Yes, that that uh, club of uh, uh-huh. uh, normative. Uh, how would you say that? Um, uh, Assurance or direction that well, you know this is the direction we need to take. Yeah, that's that's wielded uh, quite liberally uh, in in uh, in our age. Now, if we get back though to um, well, we're well, talking about um, merging the, sec- the sacred and the secular. Uh, well, Hegel is a monist, right? Uh-huh. So uh, for him, everything it points towards uh, the Geist, uh, the absolute, uh, a spirit, and so on. And part of the um, Progress for Hegel. This is sometimes why he's a, a, a punching bag for classical uh, in the classical room, classroom a little bit. Is his uh, he takes upset, uh, exception with Aristotle's first principle, which is uh, the law of non-contradiction. Yes. Which uh, so something can't be um, uh, the same and not the same, or at the same time in the same way. Uh, so if we're going to say it's raining out right now. Well. You can't say it's raining and not raining in the same way at the same time, right? Uh, unless we've changed our definitions uh, somehow. Uh, so Hegel's going to come along and say, well, 
yeah, that we can, that we don't need the law of non-contradiction. It's merely a, um, a temporary thing in some ways, there, uh, because whatever truth you have in one era can mm. come in contact or conflict uh, with another truth, another era, which now leads to a higher synthesis. Mm -hmm. And so this is Hegel's dialectic, his, um, how would you call that, uh, well, there's a thesis, mm -hmm. then there's antithesis, leads to a higher synthesis. Mm -hmm. So there's always this progress as well. And this goes deep into the way he uses logic mm -hmm. uh, to how he understands history. Well, let's get specific about that, because that sounds sure. very nebulous um, and sounds very mis well, mystical, I guess. What Historically, how do you have a thesis and an antithesis? Because okay. yeah. we would think so, in a Socratic sense yeah. of, of a dialectic as a dialogue. Right? Uh, right. You know, yeah. it, uh, we have two people talking and sharing their perspectives, right? And out of that dialogue, maybe we get to uh, the truth. Yeah. He's talking about a historical dialogue or a historical dialectic. How does yeah. that make any sense? Okay, so a good example would be uh, thinking of our... Um, Socratics, or maybe our pre-Socratics. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have Parmenides, who is going to say everything is being, mm -hmm. right? So there's no motion, right? Everything is one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas um, Heraclitus is going to say the opposite: everything is becoming, mm -hmm. right? And so fire is his great um, arcade because uh, uh, this is everything's in movement, right? Well, Hegel is going to say Plato takes both of them. Mm -hmm. and merges them. Yes. So there's this realm of uh, particulars below that we see that's constantly changing. It's uh, ephemeral and uh, shadowy. Uh, so this mm -hmm. is what's a constant change, L like like Parmenides, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the eternal, the one, that's what Plato was, uh, or Plato points to source, well, that's what Heraclitus was on about. So Hegel's mm -hmm. going to say, yes, he's, he's arrived. There was a, uh, a thesis, an antithesis, and now there's a synthesis mm -hmm. in, uh, in Plato. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of the logic that, that he's, uh, mm -hmm. or the line of reasoning that he's using. Sure. But it's not just ideas. In fact, it's right. not even primarily ideas, right? It's also yeah. about how society itself is structured. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and well, in fact, all of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can have different uh, societies that, that, that um, emerge one from another to lead to a, uh, a new one. And, um, I mean... Kant kind of does this a little bit, where he's going to take reason and apply it to a, um, in an abstract way to nations, uh -huh. so nations can be reasonable, just like you and I can follow the categorical imperative uh, uh -huh. in our our day to day because it's a reasonable, it's it, uh -huh. uh, right. Well, so too can nations, right? Uh -huh. uh, and so now, this we get the League of Nations. It really ties back to some of Kant's thought. Well, Hegel is going to go further. He's going to, he's going to one-up uh, Kant mm -hmm. in this. So it's not just nations, but all of humanity mm -hmm. is one. Mm -hmm. uh, right? So we're like one rational agent, if you want to think mm -hmm. of it that way. Uh, and what are we doing? Well, we're unfurling the Geist, uh, the absolute, right? the absolute spirit. So every time we get in touch with a higher level of being, well, that's us coming to a deeper understanding and a, a revelation of of the absolute mm -hmm. in our midst mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so I, I mean i guess it's worth saying there that like kant uh, for what kant, kant's first move is to kind of uh do weird things between the, with, with the relationship between us and reality right sure that in some sense everything that we perceive as being real is in some sense constructed by our own minds out of its engagement with the reality we can't actually Yes, so, yeah. Um, he's not an idealist in the strictest sense where he thinks that there's nothing there but what is in mind, like Berkeley or something, I guess. Yeah. Um, but in a, in a certain sense, like, yeah, everything that's real is just kind of what our minds, the way the human mind is constructed, uh, it's, it, it makes sense of the world around it in a certain way. And so there's a sense in which the world is just a product of our mind. Right. Yes, because the noumena, that's the, uh, the things, uh, the itself, things yeah. of themselves of which we The reality outside of our minds. Yeah, we can't yeah. really access them. Yeah. So he's a transcendental idealist, uh, idealist yeah. because um, our ideas are kind of trans... The noumena transcends uh, mm -hmm. that in that sense. So all, yeah. so all that we can access is the phenomena. And so all what, we have is a phenomena. So what that's Hegel right. is kind of going to say then is that in one sense, I mean, Hegel kind of is an idealist, where reality well, yeah. just is what we think it is in a sense, but it's like we collectively... Like what the zeitgeist is, like what the spirit of you know the people, right, yes. the, of the age. What our that's what reality is in some way. So the way we think, and so this would be like the way society is structured, right? And the ancient world, you have des, um, despotic rulers, and you also have slaves. Yes. And yes. this is, you have there's two categories. Yeah. You have uh, another. You have one, and then you have another. 
right? Yeah. Well, that's a tension that's not going to coexist well for long. It'll, it'll work for a bit. It has to work for society to kind of get off the ground. The pyramids have got to be built somehow. But then eventually the contradictions in that will start to reveal themselves. And that's not going to last for long. Eventually there's going to be a synthesis. There's going to have to be some, something he's got to give. Yeah. Uh, and they'll merge into each other. The master and slave will merge into each other into this new synthesis. Uh, but that's just going to produce a, a new... So you, you no longer can have a master and a slave. That, that people will recognize that that's a contradictory idea. Yeah. Uh, but what it will result in is a new social order of, let's say, uh, landlords and serfs. So mas master and slave, that, that doesn't work anymore because there's an idea that, like, uh, the, I guess this would be Hegel's account of history. The, the pharaoh or whoever, the, the emperor of China, is a son of the gods, or the son of God. Uh, he's he's the, the Lord Most High. Well, that, and then the people, everyone else is just a lowly slave. Maybe they're made out of the dirt or whatever. Okay, but, yeah. but that doesn't, but you know, eventually that's not gonna, that can't hold. The idea will eventually come, though, well, maybe we're all made in the image of, maybe we're all sons of God. So we can't be slaves anymore. Yeah. So there's a merger. The, the other, uh, the, the tension between the two others uh, is it resolves into the synthesis. Okay, we're getting rid of the idea of slavery. But that leads to a new master slave dynamic or dialectic. Now it's the landlord versus the serf. And that'll work for a bit until the contradictions in that work out too. Like, how can we say that you know Christ has died for everybody, but some of us are subordinate to each other? And eventually, that's gonna you know there will be tensions that's gonna break out in violence sometimes until some kind of synthesis is arrived at, which would be like democracy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where, so this is so again, history is working itself out in these. There's a thesis, ruler, or master. There's an antithesis. Maybe it's the slave. Yes. Uh, and. Just like in an argument, they're going to argue with each other, not just intellectually, but over the course of history. Yeah. Developments will happen until something resolves itself in revolution or something. Yeah. And that will create a new social order that resolves that, but that might create a new contradiction, a new kind of opposition, like, right. like yes. landlord and serf, yeah. until that, and that will find attention. And, he, and, and you know, that will be reflected in the religious beliefs. Right? Right. Yeah. So for Hegel, right, you've got... Uh, I guess ancient pagan worship, emperor worship, Caesar or papism or whatever. Uh, that's, that's the religion that sanctifies the social order, and that gets defeated. But then you have the serfs and landlords. The religion that goes with that is Catholicism, right? Right. Uh, which he would perceive as like, oh, you know, it's lords ruling over the poor uh, people in the pews or whatever. Well, then you finally have the resolution of, no, no, every man is his own pope. The universal right. priesthood of believers, yes. okay. which is Protestantism, right? right. Yes. So for Hegel, that Protestantism is the high, and, and the point here is not—it's also not just descriptive; it's normative. Every step is better than the last one. Just like in a Platonic right. dialogue, the yes. hope is we're getting closer to truth. Right. As we discard these ideas from before, you know, we prove that Euthyphro's earlier definitions of piety don't work, or yes. the Republic proves that all these definitions of justice don't work. As we proceed and synthesize and get better, yeah. we get closer to the truth. And in history, we're also. This, yeah. this historical dialogue is getting us closer to the ideal state, the freedom, the liberation of the human spirit. So, yeah. you know, Catholicism was better than paganism, but Protestantism is better still. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, feudalism was better than a slave society, but, like, the Prussian state is better than that. Yes, right? yes, Democracy yes. is better than that. Yeah. And, and that's where it's all headed. Right? Sure, yeah. Okay, two, two, uh, two remarks to make there. Uh, one... Uh, from Augustine and one from Marx. Uh, so for Augustine, again, this is a radically, we have to adopt a radical agnosticism in this current age in the terms of how can we interpret historical events mm -hmm. in a definitive normative way. Uh, by that, what I mean is Augustine is going to point out once Revelation stops with the last apostle, um, we're still in play. History is still happening, mm -hmm. but we're not at it positioned to make those claims as to uh, like in the, this 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 era is better than the next era, mm -hmm. this era oh it led up to this and now we're now this is even better and so on so whether Constantine you know adopts Christianity now oh this is a new era well um, it might be better but it might not be than the previous mm -hmm. one so so that that's a radical difference Augustine's going to have with that type of thinking mm -hmm. which which Hegelian thought which you just outlined there mm -hmm. is. Uh, throughout, shot through our, our contemporary culture. Um, mm -hmm. Now, another point with Augustine is that, well, how do we know if we're getting better or not? It's not through the r r lens of um, historical development or our progress in that sense. It's the order of love. That's how we mm -hmm. can, that we do, have a, we do have a criteria. So we're not left with no knowledge. We're not left with lack of understanding what to do, but we do know what to do. And in fact, um, it's l loving things rightly. 
that, that, that will achieve perfect justice. Uh, so, um, so Augustine does give us that point as to uh, how do we know if we're going to the city of God or what is the city of God, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, the part with Marx is he's going to take that type of thinking mm-hmm. and uh, it's going to be as both prescriptive and normative. Uh, and I mean, listeners interested can go back to our earlier discussions on Marx and the mm-hmm. six stages of communism and so forth. But it's really, it becomes quite clear to see how that uh, materialistic dialectic follows naturally from that type of thought. Um, 